Ladies and gentlemen, today I've got some very exciting chess to share with all of you. Magnus Carlsen, Hikaru Nakamura, and many, many other chess grandmasters have currently ventured to Qatar, where the Qatar Masters is being held. This is an extremely strong tournament. I will put a link in the description for you to check it out. Over, like, nearly half the field is from India, and all of them are 23, 24, 25, 2600 rated, which is just incredible to see. India represent. Uh, we've got Magnus, Hikaru, so many top players there playing for a massive prize fund. The event looks spectacular. And Magnus is doing his thing. Today in round one, he got started nice and good by sacrificing a couple of rooks. And you know I'm going to cover that. Uh, before I show you this game and a couple of games from round number one of Qatar Masters, I just want to tell you one thing. Big news. This thing is now just 12 days away from coming out, 13 days, and it is available in India. Chess Base India. Shout out to Sagar Shah and the incredible Chess Base India team now is listing the book in India as well. So it's available in the US, it's available in the UK, it's available all over Europe. You just have to find a link below. You want it in Spanish, you want it in German, it's coming out in Czech, it's coming out in Polish, and many, 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 many more. So uh, super exciting times, the book is coming out. Uh, I will keep talking about the book because I'm very proud of it. I think the book is awesome. And in the US, we're nearly at 20,000 pre-orders, so get it before it sells out. It won't sell out. Magnus Carlsen, White Pieces versus Srihari, LR, and it, by the way, my initials, LR. Uh, this is an international master from India who's got to make a name uh, for himself because uh, chess.com doesn't even have a profile photo of Srihari. This is kind of the, the messed up world we live in. This person hasn't gotten on the map yet, but they're clearly a very good player. Uh, chess.com, can we get a... Actually, a few people in today's recap don't have photos, so we're going to, you know... Uh, Magnus opens with c4, but it very quickly goes back to being a d4 opening. Very interesting. Uh, I, I wonder why Magnus did not play d4. I Maybe he wanted to avoid a queen's gambit accepted? Like, maybe his opponent played uh, d4, d5, c4, c I don't know. <laughs> I, I really, there's no, I, listen, Magnus is like the best player in the world. I, I don't think he avoids the preparation of 2400s. Magnus plays in English. Uh, but then turns it into a queen's pawn, and this is the Slav defense, knight f3, knight f6. Magnus already plays an interesting move, which is g3. Uh, you will notice that Magnus actually spent three minutes on that move. So, clearly, you know, d4, knight f3, knight f6, and normally in the Slav defense, white plays knight c3. But there are two Slavs possible. There is the open Slav, which is dc, and then white either plays a4, pre preventing b5, or plays e4, allowing b5, or white, uh, the, black does not do that, and black plays the semi-slav. Magnus plays g3. So he plays this in Catalan style. Basically, he plays the Catalan setup, and he wants to play bishop g2 with long-term pressure. He doesn't mind his opponent taking on c4, because he's probably just going to develop castle and then deal with this later. This is very Magnesian. He has done this in a handful of games. But his opponent plays bishop f5. Uh, his opponent's time doesn't even move. He spends exactly 30 seconds. Bishop f5 is very simple, just trying to get the pawn out to e6. But this move already gives ammunition to Magnus. Because now, black is basically saying, I don't want to take the pawn. I don't want to accept the challenge of taking the pawn on c4. So, instead, I'm going to bring my bishop out to f5. And so, Magnus plays knight c3, which simultaneously puts pressure on this and takes any way, uh, uh, this, you know, from going to e4. But there's a hidden idea. Magnus now completely switches the game plan. So this bishop is an offering up to white. So Magnus goes here and now attacks the bishop. Why does he try to do this? Why does he try to put the knight on h4 to try to take the bishop on f5? You know what I can hear right now? You can't hear this. We have a neighbor with a small dog. And that small dog will randomly throughout the day just start barking for like 10 minutes straight. And that's what I can hear right now. You can't because of the settings of this microphone. Small dogs are not real dogs. I'm going to say this right now on camera. Why did you buy a rat? Why? Why did you get a rat? You could have just gotten a rat. It would have had the exact same. My dog is 55 pounds, like 25, 26 kilos. That's a real dog. That's not a real dog. It just sits there yapping. You might as well have gotten a little stuffed animal that makes noise. Right, just saying it right now. You have a small dog? We have beef. On takes c4, knight takes f5. Why did Magnus go for that? Because you got to do something at this level. 
for Magnus to defeat a player 400 points lower than them, he needs just, just a little bit of imbalance. A little pawn structure imbalance, a little piece imbalance. And so now the plan could be to develop like this. But Magnus plays something very unique. He plays e3. So the pawn on g3 was designed for the bishop to go to g2. That is why Magnus played that move. But he's changing the plan. The plan is changing and he's not worried about the potential weaknesses over here. This is a very big moment in this game. Uh, Black has multiple ways of setting up now. He could play g6. He could play knight bd7. And then after bishop takes c4, he can move this bishop. You know, he could play b5 and knight b6. But you're not going to play these moves against Magnus. Like, you just, you feel weird playing b5. You feel weird provoking the goat. So you just kind of make solid moves. You know, you just play like bishop d6, you know? Now you notice Black, he, he's played pretty quickly. Bishop d6 played pretty quickly. Um... Bishop takes c4, clearly Magnus' idea, and now we're going to see the other idea. When black castles, which is a very easy move to play, Magnus is going to play queen to f3. So the bishop and the queen are out and comfortable. The bishop does not go on that square anymore. Magnus has a little pressure here. He has two center pawns. His opponent has no center pawns, by the way. He has c and f fighting for the center, and he's going to try to use that open center. And, Magnus, and his opponent plays g6. No, notice, by the way, Srihari has not spent any time. I don't know if this is prep. I don't know what this is. Clearly, Black is well prepared. He is unafraid of Magnus up 10 minutes on the clock. Now, it's actually maybe not so good for White to castle. I mean, he could. He could. But if you just leave the king here, then how are you going to play? Are you going to play in the middle? You're going to go here and here? Maybe it's better to create an attack. That's exactly what Magnus does. He plays h3. He's not going to castle. Magnus, castle. Well, why, well, he's just going to play g4. Black is going to go knight bd7. Magnus is going to go g4. He's going to get this big attack. He's, he doesn't need to castle. And that's how he's going to win. He's going to play bishop d3. He's, he's about to make this look super easy. All right? Queen e7. And now Magnus plays g4. What? <laughs> yeah. Spent 10 minutes. Spent 10 minutes. He clearly didn't like something. He didn't like something. And I think what he didn't like was this move c5. You see, queen e7 defends the b7 pawn against this queen and puts pressure here. Now, f4 looks nice, but it's not, it's not doing anything. It, it, this is not... I can always go this way. I think Magnus didn't like c5, which is actually quite an annoying move, because if you take, then black just gets development, or even goes bishop e5 and then takes back later with the knight. Uh, but that would be weird. Just take back on c5. Uh, and d5 allows knight bd7, knight e5. So this is actually quite annoying. And Magnus spends 10 minutes and castles 20 minutes down, but the position's very tense. Now black plays h5. He thinks for 12 minutes, and he says, you know what? I don't like that Magnus can play g4. Of course he could have played knight bd7, but then Magnus would have played g4 and king g2 and slow, just slowly would have just slowly. Now what, what would black do there? Maybe b5 counterattack, right? But instead of that, you are just so nervous. You're like, I don't want Magnus to even play g4. I'm going to move this pawn in front of my king because I'm safe. Magnus is never going to play g4. He can't. So now black has total clamp on the move g4. Nice move. So Magnus plays rook e1. He's preparing the move e4. In the future, not right away. Like, you know, black will play knight bd7. Maybe white will play bishop d2. Maybe, maybe white will go e4 right away. Maybe, maybe he can, you know, take, take, take. Maybe rook e4. And Magnus is going to have pressure. And after queen f6, maybe he'll play like bishop h6. Not right away, that would hang the queen. But, you know, he'll go here and... He, he will do that, but he will win in the Magnesian way. So black plays knight e4. Knight e4 uh, stops white from playing e4 himself. And you would think white can play g4 here, but you, you can't do that. Because, you, you, because after takes, there's queen h4, and you're under a lot of pressure. So this is a tough spot for Magnus, because if he tries to kick out the knight, black is going to play rook e8, maybe bishop b4, and he's going to not allow white to play that. So Magnus plays g4. Am I living in, like, a weird alternate dimension? I mean, I just said he's trying to play g4, so he's not going to castle. Black plays h5, stopping g4. Then black plays a move which allows g4, but g4 can't be any good. Why would he play g4? After takes, there's takes, the queen is coming to h4. Yeah, apparently it doesn't matter. None of this matters. The white king is completely safe. Doesn't matter. g4, knight g5, the queen's just going to go back to g2. Makes absolutely no difference. 
Magnus just plays g4. That's real bad. That's that's really bad if he's gonna land that move. Srihari notice spends 23 minutes on the move knight e4, gets hit with this, spends another 20! 20! What did he think was gonna happen? This is how you know you've messed up in chess. You spend 23 minutes on a move. You probably calculated this. Probably calculated 94, a couple of other moves. Dude plays the move that you probably calculate. You go, oh my God, what have I done? What was he thinking about, right? That's the effect of playing Magnus. Now after take takes, he realizes, oh man, I really messed this up. I probably thought I had something. He, he, I got news. He doesn't have anything. Maybe he thought about knight g5 and pawn to f4. He doesn't have anything. There's nothing here. e4. E5, it, there's nothing. And it gets from bad to worse, my friends. And now Magnus starts styling on his opponent. Bishop B4 with pressure on this knight. Magnus says, pawn takes F5. <laughs> Leaving this to die. Knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes. Magnus has blundered into a rook fork. The rooks are completely hanging. You know what Magnus plays here? Magnus knew that. He sacrificed both rooks. Queen to g4. Look at that. Spend some time. He has a lot of options. f6, e4, queen g3, queen g3. He plays queen to g4. Both rooks hanging. Gives them up. Doesn't need them. Calculating that these pieces are going to launch an attack on this king. The threat is queen takes pawn with a check. Black's best defensive move is queen f6. At which point Magnus would have probably taken, but now Black has the gangster King G7! And if you play Discover Check with the Queen, there is a trade, and at the end of it, the rooks are still hanging. So you would probably have to move the bishop and give up one of the rooks. But, his opponent plays King G7. And in this position, Magnus has one and only one winning move. It's time to bail out. He's probably gonna have to sacrifice the bishop and then play Rook B1. No. My friends, the best move in this position is to sacrifice the rooks with pawn to e4. What? <laughs> Do you know what this does? It does two things. It gets you one step closer to playing f6 fork, e5, f6. But most importantly, this move opens the door for the bishop. It doesn't matter which rook dies because the idea is to play e5, f6, and bishop to h6. And somehow, Magnus calculated his opponent cannot do anything. Bishop g5, pawn to f6 check. The computer here finds uh, some, you know, some better execution, like pawn to e5 first, but bishop g5, f6 check, and uh, cool common collected. Just take back. He sacrifices a bishop, because if you take... You cannot stop queen h6 and queen g7. Look at this position. Black is up five points of material, but he can't move. And that is how Magnus Carlsen got started in Qatar, by forcefully checkmating his opponent on the dark squares and by sacrificing his rooks, walking directly into a fork to very quickly, methodically, one cut, and it's just like execute, like a little butcher's cut, just that's it, dead. Good start. Let's see if he wins the tournament. Speaking of other good players, Hikaru is the board two of his event. His opponent is also from India. Vantika Agrawal, who's a, a strong uh, women's player, um, player overall, but also I think she's like a top, she's like an Olympic member there of the women's team. I mean, she's, she's, I think she's like 16, 17. I could be completely wrong because that country has, you, you, Indians, y'all got so many good players, but I think she's like 16, 17. Uh, I, I could be completely underestimating, but she's a very, very good player. And uh, she also plays a Catalan. We just saw a Catalan set up in that game. Now, Hikaru's got a much tougher task. You know why? Because Hikaru is playing black. And playing for a win with black is very difficult. Especially at this level. So, Hikaru plays this very provocative Catalan system, Knight e4. What this does, and we can even look at it from Hikaru's perspective, what this move does is it wastes a second move in the opening with the knight, but then black wants to play c6, knight d7, and f5. And what Hikaru is setting up is actually an opening many of you might know. It is the Stonewall Dutch. It's like a Dutch defense. It's like white played f, uh, d4, f5. 
and then c4, knight f6, g3, e6, bishop here, d5, something like knight f3, right? It's like we got here. And then, you know, bishop e7, wherever white's knight is in the game, I think the knight is on c3, and then knight d7, queen c2, and something like this. This is the position that we are covering in the game. In fact, look how similar it looks. I just got you to that position, the only difference being black wasted an extra move playing here and here. But the position looks very similar, which is very interesting. So Vantika took, she's already down 30 minutes on the clock, and she goes for a position, the best move is 91 and try to hammer out white center, but she goes for a trade. I think she went for a trade to relieve the tension a bit, and the good thing about this opening for white, very tough to crack. And she plays f3. Now, Hikaru at this point knows he's playing for a win. Like, he's got to win. He's not trying to make a draw against somebody 350 points lower rated than him. Just not trying to do that. So how's he going to play for a win from this position? He's got to do it in a way that keeps the tension, right? Bishop to a6, puts some pressure on this pawn on c4. Vantica goes here, takes, takes. How are you going to win this position? No knights. If anybody enjoys an advantage, it's white. Anybody, right? It's a very tense position, but how are you going to win this? Hikaru goes queen g6. He tries to trade queens with his opponent, uh, which is great, right? Like, you would think white would go here, but this is imbalance. And then maybe she'll go here, and he'll go king f7, and then he's going to try to advance, right? Like, if she plays f4, he might take... He might open things up, so maybe she does have to defend herself with the rook here, right? And then he's gonna go here, or maybe bishop c5 in the future, and then he's gonna try to push this, like, there's little ways, so she plays queen c1, and you'll notice she's spending a lot of time, and now, this is where Hikaru now activates 2780 mode, h5. h5 is very provocative. Very provocative move. And now h4. And in this position, she now had to nip this attack before it turned into anything, she had to play queen b1, trying to get a queen trade. And now if Hikaru stayed around over here, he would lose this pawn if he went to h5. So queen to h6, g4, g5. And she turns the attack back around on him, but instead Vantika plays king f2. There's nothing really wrong with this move, but now Hikaru comes barreling down the other side of the board. Now she goes for a queen trade, but now Hikaru says no, and her king moves, so she can't really fight back. Hikaru takes on g3. The black king now, the white king now has to defend the bishop, and now just very cool, calm, collected bishop to c8. The computer already wants like rook f7 here to try to play g5, I guess, and try to double up and all of this. He plays bishop c8, and let's not, his opponent doesn't have enough time. Vantika has two minutes. She trades the rooks, and she continues to attack, but she has 48 seconds. It's just not enough. Hikaru infiltrates with his queen, and he gets the queen trade. And that's very important, because despite having 40 seconds, the pressure is really what's going to win the game here. It's not even the time trouble. It's the fact that it's really difficult to survive. She lashes forward with f6. He goes here. He takes with the bishop, because after he takes, takes... He's just up a pawn. And not only is he a pawn up, he is up a pawn in, an, in a same colored bishop endgame. Rook e5 back. She takes on f6, but he takes on c4, and he's just up two pawns. And uh, Vantika has this h pawn. She's going to try to use it. And um, she gets her extra 30 minutes, which is what they get on the 40th move, but it's not enough. And Hikaru, methodical. Like the Terminator, puts the rook on the second rank, gets that pawn there. e5 is a nice move to try to deflect uh, and to try to play bishop to f3. He goes here. Uh, she goes to e3. He goes here. He's just up two pawns. And this is a completely winning endgame. He's just going to walk up the board. He's going to push that pawn to e3. He's going to take, and there's nothing to be done. She defends as best as she can, but she resigns because he's just going to walk his king in. And uh, this bishop is not getting to the corner. So this is always winning. It's going to be king g3, king f2. And uh, you have to be a little careful here how you do this. But bishop e4 and bishop 2 f3 is how he would win this game. So actually this would be a draw. Because this would be a stalemate. <laughs> and bishop takes would end up a uh, theoretical draw. But we don't have to get into all that. Hikaru wins. Magnus wins. And now, uh, let's. some of you can leave now. Because, you know, you guys want to watch Magnus and Hikaru. You'll let the real chess fans stay. You guys can go click on something in your sidebar. I'll squeeze this little stress thing, you know, because I'm stressed out that you're 
leaving, you know? A little grip strength thing. Nice little squeezing. Anyway, um, those of you that want to stick around, I'm going to share two absolutely epic games with you. Uh, this is a game between Rafael Lagunau from Germany and Jordan van Forest, who I actually uh, uh, am very excited to see play in this event. And um, I hope he does very well because Jordan plays a lot of exciting chess. What is that light on my... That's light? What is that? Weird. Um, and then I have a game for you that, 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 that was just a knockout in like 10 minutes. So that's going to be very fun and you're going to see a gangster checkmate. E4! Jordan plays my opening! Because I invented this opening. Karl Kahn defense. Uh, white plays the two knights and now bishop to g4 is one of the main lines where black trades the bishop and plays uh, knight to f6 and hopes that, you know, e5 happens. Bishop e2. Jordan plays this. Develops his dark squared bishop to g7. And here, white is very clearly preparing d4. So black plays d4 himself. And where did white lose his time? 17 minutes on castling? Maybe he got locked in the toilet. Maybe he had diarrhea. Rook d1. Jordan plays here. Takes the center. Takes the center. And now is ready to play knight c6. I love this. I wish I could play the Karl Khan like this. White plays a4 to try to take space on the queen side. Jordan says, you know what? You castled h5. See, this is how good players play for a win. They're just like h5. I'm provoking. I'm trying to get an attack over here. You committed your king, so... I'm going to go that way, and good luck. Um, now, I don't really know, you know, White spent a lot of time here, like, probably being a little nervous. I don't know why White did not play bishop g5. I'm not coaching anybody or backseating anybody, but this seems like a very natural move as a response to h5. Probably didn't like something. I don't know. Probably thought queen... I don't know. I really... I'm not sure, because then knight a3 here. I don't know. Uh, but they played queen g3, and then they played knight a3, so they just did not put the bishop on g5. No problem. Jordan plays h4. White plays queen eight. That is so disrespectful to her majesty. Queen e7, now here, and now Jordan plays something really cool here. He offers a trade of bishops, which actually loses the pawn on h4, but it's a poisoned pawn because after bishop to f4, black goes g5. The king and the queen are hiding in an underground bunker together. Look at this. The queen can't get out. Jordan mummifies the queen on h2. This is really tough. Knight c4. Now Jordan castles the other way, and he is going to attack. This is about to get really uncomfortable. So something really hilarious here happens. Lagunau runs his king. The king is trying to escape the kingdom. Look at this. I've never seen something like this before. Look at this. King b8, that's not, he's not trying to go with him. The king just runs. What is going on? King to e1. Now, a6. Jordan's like, maybe I'm going to attack. Maybe I'm going to play king. I don't know. Now, black plays a5. Look at this. Jordan can sense that his opponent doesn't know what to do. 10 minutes left on the clock to make 20 moves. Jordan plays king a7. He doesn't spend any time. He just puts his king on a7, allowing white to think. White takes. Jordan goes here, securing an outpost on e5. The king runs to the middle of the board because the white queen can't do anything. Jordan plays knight e5. b3. Knight e8. He's rerouting and he's ready to fire with the pawn. The biggest moment of tension right now in the game. Jordan is threatening f5, g4, all of these big attacks on the king in the center. White apparently can just go here, here, and here. And black has no attack. Black can play knight b5 according to the computer, but then I don't see black doesn't have any attack because it's actually really difficult for black to add pawns. So apparently white could have just played knight takes, queen takes, bishop g4, and it's a fortress. Like rook h6 would have been played, then g3. Rook h8, take, take, f3. It's insane. But apparently, this could be a fortress. Like, of course, Jordan would play b6 and try to... But this is what Stockfish thinks on a low depth. Instead of that, white goes here. <laughs> and uh, Jordan does not look back. Knight takes c4. Now f3 pushing the bishop back. Once the... I mean, Raphael hated his pieces. I don't know what happened. He really didn't... Listen, I would have lost probably even faster. I'm not criticizing Raphael, but... 
My, my man hated his pieces this game. Chief, look at the queen! The queen and the bishop are just dead! And you know what's gonna happen when these two pieces are dead? Oh yeah, Jordan's coming. Rook d6, rook h6, and all it's gonna take is... <laughs> By the way, the king, the king, the king... Oh my goodness. Now, um, Jordan's gonna still have to break out somehow, and uh, White makes a run for it. And, you know, he makes a run for it. His queen does escape, but unfortunately, there's nowhere the queen can move. Jordan destroys the king, and the queen does touch the other side of the board, but rook d8, and White resigned because his queen is trapped. <laughs> his queen is just straight up trapped. This is, this is the saddest thing that has ever happened to a queen. Well, no, the second saddest thing that has happened to a queen that I've ever seen. I mean, I've really, I, my goodness, I, good game by Jordan. That was fun. Uh, and if, and if you stayed around, you but I, I just thought this game was very fun. Um, Nodjerbek Yakuboyev, a strong grandmaster from Uzbekistan, Olympic member of Uzbekistan, played against the person who I thought had the same name first and last when I first read that. Listen, uh, Gaur, Indians, is Gaur, Gars, is that his first name? Gaur, Garf. I thought that Chess.com put two, two names. I, I was about to yell at them. But I think I've actually played Gaur, Garf, uh, on Chess.com. His name does, I think he beat me. So, um, this was a Nimso Larson B3. And White played this gambit F3, E4. Very provocative opening where you play like this and you try to get your opponent to take and play queen f3. It's a very interesting opening. Gaur was not having any of this. He just gave the pawn right back, which is normal. But white got a very pleasant position. I mean, he kind of played this in a way where, you know, uh, and taking is not good because rook c1, and then if bishop g6, knight d5 is winning for, black, for white because you just can't defend this. Uh, now, black needed to develop. Uh, he needed to play fast here. He needed to play knight c6. He spent a lot of time. He played c6. White went here and here, and as you can tell... Nodirbek is just going for it. Uh, now he plays this move knight e2, opening up pressure of the bishop. He's trying to play knight f4, g4, and h5. He's just trying to trap the bishop. Very difficult position already for black, who plays h6. And now look at this. Excellent play from Nodirbek, very energetic. g5, I mean, nasty pressure. E5, good counterattacking move. Knight d3, he pops the bishop out to h3. It's just a very nice position. I mean, white is just adding pressure. Now Nojerbek plays this really classy move. Rook h2, trying to double his rooks without touching his king. Look at that, the position looking nice and juicy. And now the major moment in this game. Black was under pressure for a while. He was defending himself, he was worse. But f6, f6 was a big mistake because now white can just crash through. He has multiple ways of crashing through, and a lot of them have to do with that king. So Nodirbek here plays rook to g2, ready to take and go to g7. The computer wanted him to already play knight f4 and go for the bishop. He plays rook to g2, and my friends, after king to f7, g takes, g takes, and this knight coming out, ready to go to f5 and h5. His opponent in this position, wanting to get his bishop off this front line, played bishop to e7. And in this position, Nodjerbek Yakuboyev decided, I'm not going to slow play this. I'm not going to crawl forward with my knight. He played bishop to e6. Oh my goodness. I'm going to put an emote on this move. I, I just, I don't know if it's a brilliant, I mean, that is, do you know what the idea of that move is? The idea of that move is to attract the black king like a magnet and now rook to g7, which simultaneously traps the bishop on h7, but also prevents the king's escape. This pawn mo monitors the king's escape forward. The king can now not go backwards. And if black plays a move like knight to f8, knight f4 is checkmate. Pawn takes, knight takes. The king is embarrassed in the center of the board, tart and feathered. So black decides to sacrifice the bishop. And Nodjerbek already has checkmate in seven moves. He should have played knight f4, e takes, knight, uh, and then takes, and then checkmate on the next move. But instead he plays f takes e4. And the game is over regardless. Bishop to d6. And Nodjerbek plays knight f4 check, knight to d4, king e5, knight f5 discovered check. 
and he resigns because after king e4, check, the king runs forward, rook d3 mate. Oh my god. This man played bishop to e6. What a move. A full sacrifice of a bishop to seal the king's escape while simultaneously winning back your material with interest. Excellent game. Had to end it like this. Uh, shout out to Nojerbeck. Shout out to the Indian delegation. My friends, this opponent of his was Indian. Uh, there was an Indian who played Hikaru and there was an Indian who played Magnus. I mean, India, y'all are crushing it. And those of you watching from India, check out the book on Chess Base India. There are only like 600 copies available for now. So it, it, they might run out fast and then they will have to maybe order more. I don't know. Talk to Sagar Shah. But book is available in all places. It's coming out October 24th. Um, cool announcements coming soon. I will be doing live book events in New York City. Some fan events. You will have a chance to meet me if you're from here or if you're visiting. Uh, I will sign your book. We can take a photo together. Maybe you don't want a photo. Uh, maybe you're more famous than I am. I don't know. In any case... Qatar Masters is on. Magnus is sacrificing rooks. Whoever wins the event uh, will have uh, will lay claim to uh, winning a super, super awesome tournament. And a good friend of mine actually is in Qatar. Shout out to international master Alexander Ostrovsky from New York City representing. I almost went to the tournament. Not really. He tried to convince me to go to come out of retirement to play in Qatar Masters. I said no, then I beat Faruja. it's still no. I'm not playing any tournaments anytime soon, but I will be cheering on my good friend. Uh, maybe I'll cover a couple of his games as well, and that's all. See you for Qatar Masters Round 2. Get out of here.